right, guys, welcome back to Days of Darkness, and welcome to my review of Friday the 13th, Part 5, A New Beginning. Now, uh, well, I'm obviously eager to get into this. I can't even list off the damn cast. First of all, this movie came out in 1985, <laughs> starring John Shepard, Melanie Kinnaman, and Shavar Ross, and was directed by Danny Steinman. Now, uh, going off of Part 4, um... I always, it's funny because I, anytime I watch this series, I obviously always watch them in order. And once I get done with my favorite entry in the franchise, I'm always curious to rewatch this one again because my reaction's always a little different. Not, it's not super contrasted or anything. I usually have a fairly good time with this film, but I'm always wondering, like, how do you follow up? what in my opinion is one of the best slasher movies of all time in the final chapter. And I gotta say, they do a pretty damn good job here. Uh, like I like the characters, not as strong as part four, but I do think for the most part they're all fairly entertaining. Some of them this time around are a little more disposable than uh, part four, uh, which this movie unfortunately is cursed with being, at least in my mind, I always compare it to part four for some strange reason. Just because the direction they go in that with this one is like, it's very drastically different <laughs> than what they would end up doing. But uh, for some reason, I always like to compare this to part four, which does not do this movie any favors, but nonetheless. Anyways, but yeah, I honestly really enjoy this one. Uh, it's nowhere near my favorite, obviously. There are a couple ones that I would put before this one. However, if you're one, if you're running through this series like I'm currently doing, I would absolutely give this one a watch. Uh, by no means is it a bad slasher film. It's not like horrible or anything like that. Uh, it's just there is some aspects of it that I'm not very fond of. Mainly the direction they take with the overall story. Uh, they're... <laughs> It's mostly because they don't... It, this movie is kind of tarnished because the direction they go in... And I'm trying to keep it vague here for spoiler... For the sake of the spoiler-free section, we will obviously get into what I'm talking about in the spoiler section. But they just don't follow up on the ground that this one is laid. Like, they very much so almost kind of write this one off, unfortunately. Uh, which is a little bit of a shame. However, I do prefer the direction they go in, which makes this one kind of disposable, which is a shame because I think John Shepard gives an excellent performance as Tommy. Uh, I think Shavar Ross as <laughs> Mr. Uh, Mr. Reggie the Reckless is hysterical. Uh, and really just a lot of really good memorable performances. You have Demon, uh, who's just again a riot same actor who i the name totally escapes me right now <laughs> but uh the same actor who was in uh, uh return of the living dead which we have previously talked about on this channel and yeah all around got some fun characters got some really really cool kills and we will obviously get into that in the last section of this video but uh but yeah overall i would absolutely give this one a watch i'm gonna quit rambling now so we can get into the spoiler section and let's just do it to it let's uh spoil the shit out of this All right, spoiler time. Your ass has been worn. Now let's get into this. So, um, talk about a new, new bold direction, as I talked about in the uh, spoiler, uh, spoiler free section, I should say. Um, immediately, we are doing away with the old way of Friday the Thirteenth movies, and we start off with a dream sequence, which is pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> I like that they. Uh, Obviously, this film and its plot and its direction is all very risky. And I think that is, uh, I think that's pretty apparent right from the jump of having a dream sequence to start out a Friday the Thirteenth movie. Uh, just cool stuff, cool stuff all around. But so we have uh, Corey Feldman in this little dream, reply reprising his role as Tommy Jarvis. He is snuck into a graveyard and uh, happens upon two grave robbers robbing the grave of Jason Voorhees. Uh, which is also very reminiscent of the events that happened for real in part six, which we will obviously talk about in the review for part six. But right now, 
Uh, Tommy is strictly just watching these guys through the bushes. It's raining. Great scenery. Uh, really, really cool stuff. And obviously, when you go fucking around with Jason Voorhees, the inevitable is going to happen. And these, uh, these dream gentlemen get uh, killed. And then Jason slowly approaches young Tommy and... Right before he goes to do him in, uh, Tommy wakes up as a much, much older gentleman. Uh, John Shepard playing him this time around. Very good performance from John Shepard. Uh, really, really like his performance. And he's a bad motherfucker, too. Uh, <laughs> Tommy is not playing around in this. Uh, he's obviously very traumatized. And it's, I guess, led him to take some self-defense classes. Because at one point, <laughs> or karate, or judo, or fucking some shit... Because uh, at one point, he takes Eddie, who's kind of the suave, douchey, sort of, like, pretty boy. And he's fucking around with Tommy, and he does some weird sh Like, does some insane kung fu, whatever the fuck, and slams this dude through a table. <laughs> ECW style, baby. Shout out to the Dudley Boys. Got him, Mark. Anyways. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, bad motherfucker in this. And he's just... He gives a really... He portrays being fucked up pretty well. Uh, you know, he's definitely... You can tell he's definitely been through some trauma. And uh, he's constantly having flashbacks and visions of Jason. And I love Tommy's direction in this. Um, again, it's a shame that they kind of wrote off this story. And it's also a bit of a shame that uh, John Shepard does not re reprise his role as Tommy in future films. Uh, I do like Tom Matthews uh, more. Uh, all respect to John Shepard, obviously, but I just I just like Tom Matthews more. I think he gives a, a very energetic performance, but we'll obviously get into him in part six. But for right now, man, John Shepard John Shepard does his job very well in this movie for sure. But anyways, so he wakes up. And he is getting shipped off to Pinehurst, which is a, uh, a halfway house, sort of a, a place for troubled youths, which uh, I'm not sure how old Tommy is supposed to be here, but uh, he looks fucking 30. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure actually how old John Shepard was at the time that this was filmed, but uh, definitely looks a little older than some of the uh, some of the other people. But, you know, suspension of disbelief. I mean, I'm all used to that, but, uh, <laughs> but anyways, uh, but yeah, really cool location as well. I like that they get away from the camp. Um, again, this, up until this point, this is probably the most fresh Friday the 13th movie. Uh, it's not really, it's not really playing along the same beats. Obviously you have a bunch of, you know, bunch of young chicks and young dudes getting naked, getting stoned and getting drunk and getting killed. Uh, so that is still obviously alive and well, but uh, as far as the story goes, I really, really like it. And uh, the characters and all that shit as well, but which we will get into. But yeah, I really like that. Um, but fuck, let's just get into the character since we're on it. <laughs> uh, I already talked about Tommy a lot. Really, really like him. Uh, Reggie the Reckless. Uh, <laughs> Really, I think the first, yeah, the first kid in these movies, uh, not counting like little Jason and flashbacks and shit like that. And obviously coming up out of the water and at the end of part one, I would not consider him to be a normal kid <laughs> by any means. So we have Reggie, uh, which is cool, man. Again, introducing new stuff to the franchise. And they would obviously launch off of this completely in part six where actually they have a camp full of kids. I'm giving a lot away about part six. I should probably shut the fuck up about it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, man, Reggie's really cool. Reggie the Reckless. Uh, Shavar Ross does a really, really good job. Uh, probably, I would say he's the comedic relief for most of this film. And he's a little badass too, man. When, uh, yeah, well, we're already here. So when Jason is uh <laughs> coming after him he doesn't back down man he runs this fucker over with a uh bulldozer i believe yeah bulldozer fucking you know lots of pro wrestling imagery here fucking jumps off the uh the barn and does a cross body on uh <laughs> jason but uh yeah man really really cool stuff from uh from reggie i really really like him 
in this. Then we have Ethel. Oh my god. Ethel is fucking priceless. Uh, just <laughs> the dynamic she has between her and her son is really, really cool. And actually this time around watching it, I don't know the actress's name, but uh, I think she was supposed to be a much older woman. And when you watch it, especially on the Blu-ray transfer that I have, she is far younger than I think they were trying to make her look like. Uh, yeah, very much, much younger. But honestly, kind of pretty too. But hey, don't fucking judge me, man. I like when chicks curse. It's Anyways, I'm <laughs> divulging too much about myself. But no, uh, Ethel's obviously priceless. Uh, anytime, any, any dialogue she has is usually... For me, the biggest laugh of the film. Uh, <laughs> her kid's like, you tell him, mama. It's like, would you shut the fuck up? <laughs> it's just, she's just great. I can spout off lines from her all day, but uh, yeah, Ethel fucking rules. Uh, it's a pretty cool kill scene, too. And then we have Demon. Uh, if I had to, uh, which I... Uh, I actually looked up the <laughs> actor's name this time, uh, Miguel uh, Nunez Jr., uh, playing Demon in this, again, from Return of the Living Dead, loved him there, and I love him here, he's fucking great. Those damn enchiladas! <laughs> Sipsky. But, uh, but yeah, man, uh, Demon's so fucking cool, and, uh, that's Reggie's older brother, and it's pretty clear that he's into some some crime and shit and uh definitely not um definitely not the most upstanding individual and uh <laughs> but reggie really looks up to him and uh it's kind of cool <laughs> reggie goes into his little uh his little uh van hideout thing that he has and he she's uh reggie sees his girlfriend and he's, she's like whoa where'd you get that and uh, that's obviously a very, very attractive young woman, and, uh, he goes, <laughs> he goes, hey, Pam, baby, come here. Yeah, yeah, come here. He's like, this is my girlfriend, Pam, and <laughs> Demon's like, hello, Pam. Like, very, very charming, uh, performance by Miguel in this. Mm. But yeah, Demon's probably up there with one of my favorite Friday the 13th like characters he's just really really good really really good stuff from him uh, unfortunately we do have some less than stellar characters in this I pretty much enjoy everyone in part four uh, as I've already stated again some of them are more interesting than others obviously but uh, but man in this one it kind of takes a hit a little bit so uh, we get Pam who there's obviously nothing wrong with uh, Melanie Kinnaman's performance in this. I think she plays her role well. It's just a matter of living up to previous Final Girls. I and that's obviously not totally her fault. Um, the production of this is uh, was obviously very difficult. The director Danny Steinman has is constantly quoted as not being the best to work with, uh, and this movie was no exception. Uh, she was definitely having a hard time with that. I think that doesn't necessarily show in her performance. I, like I said, I'm not dogging on her performance at all. I think she does a good enough job, but I don't think she's given nearly as n enough to work with as previous Final Girls in this franchise have have been. Holy shit! Ooh, damn. Talking about poorly written characters makes me gassy. Anyway, <laughs> anyways. Uh, then we have Joey, who Joey gets killed off pretty early in the movie, but just an annoying fucker, dude. Like, I can tell we're supposed to feel bad for him, and I do to an extent, especially, but... Especially, like, just... Because he is a sweet kid, but he's just portrayed as just an annoying fucker. And it's like doesn't deserve to die necessarily but man it's like i kind of get why they're so fucking annoyed by him <laughs> he's a fucking cockroach dude he's so annoying but uh and then he like just fucks everything up he goes to help with the laundry and you know and hey maybe that was intentional but uh i don't think 
especially since he has such a significant role in this film in the end, I don't think they really hit the right beats with that character. I think that character should have been far more sympathetic. I think you should have felt very bad for him because he ended up, he doesn't even get killed by the killer, which obviously when you, once you find out who it is, it's not Jason. Uh, <laughs> but he gets killed by one of the other kids at Pinehurst named Vic. And uh, <laughs> he's like, you know, I'm good at chopping wood. And he's like, can I help? And Vic's like, go away. And he just keeps chopping wood. Very rageaholic young man Vic is. Also very old looking as well <laughs> with Tommy. But, uh, but yeah, man, he's like, he's like, I think you're really out of line. Well, he sets the chocolate bar. He's like, here, you can have this for later. And Vic obviously chops it in half. And <laughs> he's like, I think you're really out of line. And he turns to walk him off or storm off or whatever the fuck. And uh, Vic just chops him in the back. And you see the end result. And as he chopped that dude to, to shit. Uh, killed dead. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. Like I was saying before. Um, definitely uh, didn't portray that character in the right light for me personally. But anyways. And pretty much everyone else is fairly disposable uh nothing really too interesting or significant you have the goth girl who is uh you know just there to be a goth girl <laughs> you know and uh just just another character that literally does nothing for the most part i mean you definitely have some characters that are here strictly to be cannon fodder and uh you know just to up the body count of the uh, killer in this movie again it's not jason we will get into that in a second but uh but yeah so anyways uh let's just get into it right now since we're talking about it <laughs> so i think this movie does a really good job of being a whodunit uh not nearly as much as part one because part one was just so cool is like you're just constantly wondering like who the fuck is doing this because at that at, in part one you have no idea who jason is you have no idea about the Voorhees name at all you're just like who is killing these fucking kids and this one jason's legacy is well established and the copycat killer in this utilizes that very well Obviously wearing a slightly different hockey mask and carrying around a machete. So obviously everyone's thinking it's a copycat or oh my god Jason's back. One of the two. But uh but man I think the uh the twist it doesn't really work for me. I think first of all, I'm getting ahead of myself, as per usual <laughs> with this channel. Um there, there's some hints at it being either Vic, uh, there's hints at it being this homeless man who goes to Ethel's house looking for some work, uh, and there's, you know, it definitely alludes to certain people possibly being the killer, and then Friday Part 1 style, Pam's running around and is seeing some of the potential candidates that it could be, seeing them dead. Mainly the guy who runs the camp, who I can't remember his name right now. He's there to be an authority figure, and that's it. He really doesn't have a whole lot to do in this. But yeah, um, and it ends up being Roy. Now, if you, when I first watched this, I was like, who the fuck is Roy? <laughs> like, what? And they kind of pulled a Scream 2 on you, and they're, you're just like, Who? <laughs> Uh, and Roy is, actually ends up being Joey's dad, uh, which is weird because Joey is said to not have any family. And so when he sees him, you know, like that's like uh, Roy's a paramedic. Roy's an EMT. So he sees obviously his son all chopped to fucking hell. And you're like, okay, so... You know, at the end, you're like, okay, that it's explained that that's what fucking set him off. Is that his, he saw his son get killed by someone at this fucking, uh, at this halfway house, so he wants to kill everyone there. It's like, okay, that's a perfectly plausible reason. However, 
it said that once they're you know loading them up in the ambulance to be carted off to the morgue or what's left of them, uh, the the authority figure dude is saying that his dad ran off on him years ago. Oh, I'm like, okay, so why the fuck would he give a shit if he's dead? I mean, you know, and you could obviously go into multiple theories about why that is, but to me, that was a very glaring plot hole. But like, okay, well, why do you give a fuck? And he even has, like, a picture of him in his wallet. And I'm like, so what the fuck? Are you just stalking your son? Like, what? I don't I don't get it. I, I do not get the twist. Uh, it doesn't really work for me. And yeah, it's just kind of a... It's kind of a sort of thing. I think it would have been way more interesting. At least... You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna do that, at least have Roy be more of a major character in the film. And I don't know how you would do that, or maybe just make it somebody else. Maybe make it the the head of the house, the head of the uh, halfway house. Make it fucking somebody, you know, <laughs> anybody, anybody at all. But uh, I don't know. The Roy twist just really doesn't do it for me. He's in it for like maybe two or three scenes, and then you get the reveal. When you get the reveal, it's, again, raining outside, and it's storming and thundering and lightning, so you can barely even tell that it's him. <laughs> and then it's just, like, told to you in this last scene. And yeah, just didn't really work for me. Didn't really work for me at all. I'll be totally honest. Uh, again, I don't, I don't let that take away from the movie itself. I think this is a fun slasher. But that twist just it bogs this one down for me it really does and but we have one more twist left to go and that is that tommy is in the hospital after everything gets done basically what happens is everyone gets killed off which we will talk about all the kills in the kill of the film section damn why am i so gassy tonight Woo. anyways uh, everyone gets killed off for the most part and they go to a barn they're well they're led to a barn and uh you know, a big old brawl ensues. I'll let you guys enjoy that for yourself <laughs> in the film. Because, I, like I said, I do want you guys to actually go out and watch these things. I don't want to give you a scene-by-scene -scene breakdown. But, uh, and, you know, Roy ends up capsizing over the... Capsizing like he's a boat. <laughs> ends up falling out of the barn into a, just this bed of spikes. Which I'm not really sure what's that what that's for. But it's just a bed of spikes outside of a barn. Okay, <laughs> but uh, does the job, Roy is dead, and Tommy goes to the hospital, he's all bedded up, and uh, ends up seeing Jason one more time, having that, um, having that mirage of Jason, 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 and uh, I guess we're led to believe that Jason possesses him, or takes control of Tommy, or something. And Pam comes in there, just trying to check on him. She thinks he jumped out of the window, and then you see that he has a knife and he has the mask on. And so you're basically led to believe that Tommy is going to be the killer for the rest of the uh, series or the next movie or whatever the fuck. And uh, obviously, fans were fairly pissed off with that, and they ended up going a whole new direction. And. This one kind of just gets left off in the dust a little bit. At least for me, it really bears no significance. Um, like I said before, I wouldn't skip this one. I think it's a fun watch, but if you're watching it for story's sake, I see no reason why you can't just go from part four to part six. And that's a shame, because like I said, this movie does have, have its fun aspects. There's a lot of negative for me too, mostly. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with there's a lot of filler in it. Uh, there's a lot of, like I said before, there's a lot of characters that do not need to be there. Um, you know, it makes for some fun death scenes. I'm mainly talking about one of the paramedics, or uh, not paramedics, one of the guys who's shipping Tommy off to Pinehurst. You follow up with him a little bit, and he is uh, going on a date with this, you know, woman who is very, very clearly out of his league. <laughs> Um, and you know, that's where you get some of the trashy elements of part five. It's known for being very heavy on the sexuality and the nudity, which I don't have a problem with typically. Uh, it's, you know, 
you're gonna get you're gonna get titties in a Friday the Thirteenth movie. It's how it is. You're gonna get some fucking in there. You know, that's just how it is. And I understand that. I get it. I'm not one of these people who gets super offended by it. Uh, however, in this, I think context has a lot to do with it too. Danny Steinman, the uh, the sex scene, the very that what was shot. It was okay. I'm stuttering over my words here because I'm getting into controversy. <laughs> um, the uh, sex scene between uh, Tina and Eddie was, I mean, it's pretty graphic to begin with. But, you know, I someone was quoted as basically saying, they're like, yeah, man, we basically shot a porno out in those woods. Which immediately, every time I see it now, makes me... It, I don't know, it just, it, <laughs> it's very uncomfortable. It, it's very uncomfortable to watch. Uh, obviously, Danny Steinman, again, was a very infamous director for being not too kind and not too, uh, which I'm not saying every director needs to be a fucking sweetheart or everything. Uh, I have very little experience with directing, but I have done a little bit of it, so I understand it is a very stressful job. But, uh... There, I was, uh, I've mentioned this before, with every one of these I watched the, uh, I watched the, uh, Crystal Lake Memories to go along with this, and in part five, someone's quoted as saying that Steinman was, like, during that, the filming of that scene, he's just like, he's like, yeah, grab her tits, you know, grab her ass, grab her, you know, pussy and all that shit, and it's like, it's like, dude, you're not shooting a fucking porno, man, just have a fucking basic softer than softcore sex scene and that's it that's all you need you don't need whatever the fuck he, they shot out there and it's just you know it <laughs> there's also like lana just like you know is basically made there to like just be tits that's all she's there for she shows her tits she snorts a little coke and she dies I and mean, it's like there's no reason for that man <laughs> again I'm not one of these sensitive asses. I'm not trying to act like I'm like, like, oh my God, why would they, you know, I'm just, I'm not like that. It's, it's a horror movie. I get it. But to me, when the director doesn't, just doesn't give a shit about his, uh, about his performers and just kind of almost uses them, uh, it's very, it, it, <laughs> it immediately, my respect for the film kind of goes down. A little bit. Uh, not trying to get too preachy or anything. I'm obviously watching movies of people getting their fucking head split in half. I have no room to be offended about anything. <laughs> but uh, I wouldn't say offended. I was. Just, I would just say it's. It's very distracting knowing how uh, how much of a shithead he was during the production of this. But anyways, we're gonna get right past that shit. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, just besides that, really the twist is the main negative I have. Just doesn't do a whole lot for me. And uh, and yeah, so believe it or not, there is some stuff I like about this movie. And one thing that I really, really like is obviously my favorite part of horror, and that's the blood, the guts, the gore, the kill of the film. Let's get right to it. As far as the blood and guts is concerned in Friday the 13th Part 5, uh, very up and down. Uh, you get some really, really cool kills, which we will get into here in a second. And then you get some that are, you know, uh, they're, they're okay. You know, they're fine. Uh, but nothing I would write home about. You know, you get a lot of basic stabs to the gut and I'm like, which is cool. But it's Friday the 13th, man. I want to see people getting their heads chopped off. I want to see people getting fucking thrown out of windows and fucking crazy shit. God, you're really fucked up. Yeah, I know. Leave me alone. But anyways, we do get some really cool ones at the same time. We will get into uh, two honorable mentions. Uh, well, an honorable mention to the honorable mention is uh, actually Ethel's death. Her death of Roy actually taking a uh, meat cleaver and just essentially just punching right through the glass and 
just splitting her face open. You don't get the actual shot of it going in. Uh, I think that was cut. The good old, good old MPAA fuckers kind of, kind of took that one away from us, unfortunately. But uh, still, is a pretty cool death. You see her like her face just go like right into her stew. Uh, she like squashes a tomato in her hand. It's it's a cool it's a cool kill. It's decent. I definitely like it. Uh, but no, our two honorable mentions. We get um, pro <coughs> probably the funniest death of the movie would be uh, Ethel's son, uh, whose name escapes me right now. I didn't really bother to write it down because he's basically there to be you know <laughs> you kill them all. <laughs> But he gets his ass kicked by Tommy. Again, Tommy showing some of that, you know, bad motherfucker vibes that he has going. Um, <laughs> and he, you know, just beats the shit out of Ethel's kid. And Ethel comes, uh, not Ethel, Ethel, uh, <clears throat> Ethel's kid comes uh, riding home. And he's screaming his fucking head off. He's crying. He's bitching. He hurt me, mama. He hurt me. And he's doing fucking donuts in the. <laughs> in the front yard he's fucking riding he has like a scooter thing he's riding it up on the porch and then down the steps up the steps down the steps riding around fucking screaming his head off i'm like oh my god someone shut this fucking guy up and roy's my boy he definitely has me covered on that because uh you know he's fucking screaming ah, ah. and sure enough he comes around one of those trees and i think i believe it's a I believe it's yeah it's the meat cleaver because it's the same time he killed Ethel so he takes that meat cleaver and cleaver and as soon as he rides past it just whoop, and his head comes flying off you get that cool shot of him like <laughs> just bounces on the ground great fucking kill really cool stuff uh also pretty funny which you think that's funny yeah I do because I'm a fucking weirdo anyways um <laughs> But then we get, um, now, I know what I said before about the sex scene. Obviously, you know, they, in a rare instance where I actually appreciate the MPAA cutting it down a lot, they made it just a basic, normal sex scene, and they just kind of left it at that. Uh, they cut a shitload of stuff out of it. Like I said before, I'm really glad we didn't get whatever the fuck Steinman shot out there. But, uh, but anyways, so we get, um, just a basic rudimentary run-of-the-mill sex scene lasts about fucking 30 seconds, which I know the actor playing Eddie was actually very disgruntled with that, like, jokingly, but he was like, man, they made me look like a two-pump chump out there <laughs> on the Crystal Lake documentaries. He says something to that, uh, to that effect, but, um, we get his death first, where, no, wait, scratch that, we get his death second. Uh, post coitus he goes down to the um, down to the creek by the way I told you I'd get it in there in every one I'm determined motherfucker anyways <laughs> hashtag po post coitus <laughs> but he goes down to wash up and that's where we get our uh, in between that time that's where we get our kill of the film which I'll mention that in a second but uh, he goes down there to wash up, sees that his, uh, his Tina, his dear Tina, has now been uh, killed, which we, again, we'll get into that in a second. But he obviously backs up and he's shocked as shit, and Roy takes a leather strap and a log, or like a, I think it's a belt, I think he grabbed his belt, wraps it around his face, so his face, he's pinned up against a tree, his belt is like this, so it's like right along. It's kind of like Cyclops. He kind of has that visor thing going on. And Roy um, puts a uh, pretty thick tree branch right through the, the buckles and just starts twisting it. And so his fucking, you start to see his like skin peeling around the strap and he's fucking like, uh, just freaking out, rightfully so. <laughs> and then you just hear this. You don't get anything. Uh, that would have been a... I mean, the MPAA would have cut that in a fucking split second. <laughs> but, uh... So it's, it's, he just keeps twisting it and twisting it. There's obvious. There's actually a little editing error in it where he's going one way. And then it cuts and he's going the other way. <laughs> but besides that... Um, 
and then all of a sudden you just hear a pop, which would lead you to believe that that motherfucker's head popped open, which would have been cool to see uh, in more gory detail, but, you know, can't get everything you want. But it's still a very, very solid kill and really, really cool. Um, but no, on to our kill of the film, and that goes to Tina. Miss uh, Debbie Voorhees, which I think the fact that that actress's name, I believe it's Debbie, Debbie Voorhees. We'll go with that. Sorry. Anyways, <laughs> but uh, uh, that honor is going to go to Tina. Uh, so she's laying there post coitus. Oh my God, two for one? Two post coituses in one video? Come on, man. This is a great review. Top quality. Anyway, so she's laying there. Just got done having sex with her man, you know, she's just kind of laying naked, just, you know, gushing about the, uh, the two pump jump. <laughs> and, uh, he, and, well, she ends up <laughs> running into a different, uh, a different man by the name of Roy, and she's just laying there, and all of a sudden she see she opens her eyes, and she sees Roy with a pair of garden shears. Uh, a little bit of the burning action going on here. That's coming very soon, don't you worry. But uh, <laughs> now I have to review the burning. I have to now. But anyways, fucking takes those shears, goes right into her eyeballs. Again, you don't see it. Uh, just boom, and then you just hear this crunch. So he actually went in her fucking eyes and just went fucking brutal kill the sound is disgusting uh again would have been cool if we got a little more of a gory detail there but i think it's a really really cool kill uh and you also get a really good aftermath shot of uh eddie turning her over and she's fucking like just has this just gash just going right across her face excellent kill and then it's going to be my kill of the film. Well, guys, that's going to wrap it up for Friday 5. Uh, like I said, pretty, pretty good one. Uh, definitely has some things I'm not very fond of in it, unfortunately. And it does bog it down quite a bit. However, I wouldn't skip this one. I think it has some cool stuff to offer. has some very entertaining aspects. Uh, and yeah, guys, that's going to do it. Um, Friday 5. Uh, next time, we're actually going to be, be reviewing Donnie Darko, which is a film I have not seen before again. So I'm very excited to get into that. I've heard it's pretty fucking weird. So I'm actually really, really excited to see it. Uh, but yeah, guys, that's going to do it for uh, today's episode of Days of Darkness. Take care of each other and keep watching horror. All right. See you guys.